Hi, and welcome to Preview. My name is Guy Giampapo. Preview. 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 Five, four, three, two, one. Cue Guy. I'd like to introduce our guests. We have David Friday and his lovely wife, Erin. Uh, who run the Americana Theater down in Plymouth. Thank you for now, having me. Now, this is a welcome to our show, first of all. Thank you. Uh, when I first heard about this, uh, Michelle McGrath told me that we had this theater company in Plymouth that I hadn't heard of, but I understand you're now five years old. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, we, uh, up until this past year, though, we have a, a part of the reason why you may not have heard is that we've been a summer company only this year, our fifth year. Uh, we've uh, begun to take uh, take the next take the next step to uh, a couple of steps actually to becoming a year-round theater, mm -hmm. starting with uh, our uh, upcoming production of It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play right. down at the uh, Plymouth Center for the Arts in Plymouth. You're doing the radio show version of that. The radio show version. The uh, yeah, the film version is a little. Uh, <laughs> It'd be a little tough to put on. Uh, so <laughs> there, we found a, a wonderful adaptation by um, Joe Landry. Joe Landry. Who can uh, who's uh, adapted it and cut it down to, uh, well, you can actually, you, you can cast it from anywhere from five to as many people as you want. And we're going with the bare minimum. We've got no. five cast members, five actors, portraying over 40 plus voices. Is this a one hour show? It's, it's gonna uh, probably run about an hour and a half okay. with uh, no intermission. Yeah. You know, it's not unusual for uh, movies to be adapted to radio. You know, uh, I'm not sure how old you are, but in the old days, we had the Lux Radio Theater with Cecil B. DeMille hosting, mm -hmm. and he would take the current movies and adapt them for radio. And I mean, people love that. This is, uh, that's exactly... It's uh, like a forgotten art today, uh, though. That, that's exactly what, um, uh, what we're doing right now yeah. with this, too. Uh, uh, there's uh, been a number of challenges in doing it, but uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges is the, is the Foley, the sound effects yeah. that we do. Um, it, it, Foley has, it seems to be, has become somewhat of a, a lost art. Yes. Um, yeah. Everything's digital now, everything's done, uh, uh, you know, with recordings. And uh, where, our, where our show is set in the 1940s in a radio station, they had, um, they had all of these things, all of these gadgets that right. uh, they would use for sound effects that, um, you know, people just don't use anymore. <laughs> um, and it's... It's been a lot of fun trying to put all those things together and trying to figure out, but it's also been a challenge because uh, not only do we have to uh, find all of these sound effects, but since the show is set in a 1940s radio station, we yeah. have to have these sound effects that are also appropriate for the period of time uh, to make these sounds with. That alone is a challenge. Very much so. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, of all the, uh, the arts we have today, movies, television, theater, Radio is probably the most creative of all of them. I mean, you really, you really have to use your noggin <laughs> to create. Well, well, and it's interesting because um, there are certain sound effects that we had to make devices that they used back in the 1940s. Yeah. But there's also, um, you know, uh, some of the things like um, using pine cones, crunching them up to oh, make yeah. ice breaking. Things <laughs> in nature that just naturally mm -hmm. make these sounds that if you close your eyes, it becomes something else. Yes. Um, so yeah. that's one of the novelties of the show is you, you see all these everyday used objects or things from nature and turn them into something that they're not. And I think along <laughs> the lines of what you were saying about radio, it, it's, it's funny because everybody thought with TV and then later on with the internet that radio was just going to die, was going to go away. and A lot of people thought that. A lot of people yeah. thought that, and, uh, you know, especially with the, I remember specifically with the advent of the compact disc, everybody thought, there goes radio. Mm -hmm. the radio is just as strong oh, as it ever was, and today. it's not yeah. going yeah. to go away, it's, uh, but the creative aspects of it, you're right, are, yeah. are incredibly yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you're, is this the beginning of a new season? For, for your theater? It's the end of the 2015 season. This is the end of it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you're, you're signing off with a radio play. We, we originally had, uh, uh, we originally did the Three Musketeers this past summer at the Spire mm -hmm. in Plymouth, and um, uh, things were sort of up in the air with the company. Uh, but then Aaron and I decided to uh, take over and shift things around a little. And uh, the first thing we wanted to do was, uh, one of the problems was before we were a summer company, so the summer would end and we would sort of fall out of the public consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> uh, so one of the things we wanted to emphasize right away was getting back in there and getting into those people's minds that we're we're not we're we're still here. Yeah. And the best way to do that wasn't necessarily to start a new season right away, but it was to. Uh, I, I, this is kind of diminishing it a little, but putting a tag on the 2015 season mm -hmm. uh, and something something like a Christmas show is an obvious way to uh, to keep that public consciousness and especially to do a, a recognized title like It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that you're starting, when you're going to start your sixth year, what mm -hmm. are your plans? Oh, well, <laughs> to grow, grow, grow is uh, really the basis of what we're trying to do. Uh, we, we're still uh, kicking around some ideas, but uh, we're expanding the season, the mm -hmm. professional company season. We're going to try to do, we'd like to do four, four shows, one in each uh, season. season. Yeah. Um, but our other emphasis is going to be, and Aaron could probably tell you a little more about this, Aaron is our director of education. Okay. Uh, sh we're expanding the education program as mm -hmm. well. Uh, over the summer, we had a summer camp for kids that uh, we did. Wow. We did. It was a two week, two weeks. We did the kids did a production of Cinderella. Uh, oh, how nice! And then just recently, we had some. We started our first semester of classes. We had classes for kids uh, of any age, including adults. Uh, Ex expand on this. Tell me more about this education for children. Uh, well, wonderful. it's not only for children. That's oh. one of the things we're trying to um, offer it to anyone who wants to learn more about theater. Okay. In fact, when we first came in and decided to do this education program, a lot of the adults in the Plymouth area said, are you going to have any adult classes? And it's not something we actually consciously came up with. It was because people had started saying, you know, there's not anything for adults in, as far as theater goes. Like you can get involved with community theaters, but there's no classes, there's yeah. no teaching technique. And so that's one of the things David has taken on. Um, he teaches the, uh, he actually teaches middle school, high school and adults. And I take care of the elementary mm -hmm. kids right now. We'd like to expand where we've, we're hiring more teachers. Um, so coming up in January, we're starting our second semester. It's our winter semester, and we're going to be doing two um, elementary-aged performances. One is going to be Alice in Wonderland, and one is going to be Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do a middle high school performance of Bye Bye Birdie Jr. Wow. And then in the Perfect. spring, we will probably offer more um, classes because the winter we're kind of doing performance-based everything. Mm -hmm. um, so in the spring, we'll probably... Or, um, we'll go to a more traditional classes. So yeah. we'll have elementary, yeah. junior high, high school, adult, and then we have um, acting classes. Well, we have a um, page-to-stage class where the kids write and perform their own show. We have a cabaret, musical cabaret, where kids perform songs. Uh, we have... Um, Acting. Acting. And one of the things that we're offering that uh, we've actually, we've had some call for, and we think it, it is sort of helping us find our niche in the area is we're offering music theater classes as mm. well. So where kids actually get up and instead of, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of uh, you, kids will take voice lessons or people, not just kids, people will take singing lessons. And they'll take the singing lessons and that's wonderful. I think everybody should because personally I think mm. everybody can sing uh, and should. But um, what's usually lacking is combining the acting aspects with the singing aspects. So that yeah. while you're out there singing, you know what to do. Right. Yep. So that's one of the things that we're emphasizing as well with our program to sort of give us our niche in the area. Let me ask you this. Uh, do you get funding, outside funding for your work? We get some. Um, Does we, the state cooperate, Massachusetts? There are grants out there yeah. that uh, we have applied for. Um, We're yeah. still waiting to hear. There are, uh, uh, grants are tough. Uh, yeah. Grant writing is a, it's one of those things that, it's, it's a full-time job in itself just to, just to yeah. write grants. Uh, so we do rely on outside donations and outside funds. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's just another aspect of growing, growing what we're doing and growing the business side of it is finding the funds to keep going. Yeah, that's that's probably the most difficult thing. Absolutely, yeah, again, big challenge. And it's so uncertain all the time. Absolutely. I mean, you, you go day, day to day on stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is another reason uh, for the emphasis on the uh, education program as well, because yeah. um, while 
what we love to do is get up and perform ourselves and do the main mm -hmm. stage shows, uh, getting kids involved in teaching, that's really where you're going to uh, make your living, if that's... Right. <laughs> that's and really that is good. so wonderful. Well, you, you get kids involved in things like that. Well, you're really, you're doing a great service. You well, really, truly and, it, and it's truly wonderful. I'll share a little anecdote with you. Um, one of our kids, uh, a young boy, um, he's, uh, he's autistic mm -hmm. and he's uh, diabetic and he... Um, faces a lot of challenges. Faces a lot of challenges yeah. in his life. And uh, he was in our production of Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Oh had a wonderful time and we recently got a note from a uh, picture from his mother he did a thanksgiving turkey thing at school and on each feather he had to write what he was thankful for and one of them was the americana theater really yeah. and wow. that's really what keeps us going uh, wow, I think that's fantastic. above the money above <laughs> wanting to do the arts oh. it's things like that that really keep us going well and theater really is so excited hectic and stressful and yeah. and you feel like you're in a frenzy at all time and then something like that comes along and you're like wow that was worth it it's such great satisfaction no, yes amazing it really satisfaction it is. warms i'm getting chills even just thinking about oh. it now <laughs> i can understand that yeah. it's wonderful though oh. more fulfilling than i even imagined when oh, we I started imagine. doing it well uh <laughs> um we talked about the theater in general we talked about the uh, play that you're doing right now, the radio play. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, you have brought someone else here. I wonder if you w would introduce him. To of me. course, this is we have with us uh, Nick Mitchell, our uh, the director okay. of It's a Wonderful Life. Well, uh, uh, we're going to take a pause right here now, Aaron. I want to thank you for being thank on you our show. Thank you for having me. And now we have Nick Mitchell, who is the director of It's a Wonderful Life, the radio show at Americana Theater. Welcome to our show. Well, thanks for having me, guy. Okay, what are the problems with directing? <laughs> <laughs> Put you on the spot right away. What are the problems? They're challenges, first of all. Okay. Um, we're here to tell a story that everybody already knows. Mm -hmm. And there's a balance between giving people what they're expecting and what they want and creating something new for them to enjoy. There's a lot of expectations attached to It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. It, it's been around a little while. And uh, I think a, a better director than I, named Frank Capra, told the story pretty well already. I know the man very well. <laughs> well you are lucky. Yes, you are yeah, lucky. Very, very fortunate. That's, that is, you know, when that first came out, when that movie first came out, it was a flop. And for many years, people ignored it. And then all of a sudden, it just blossomed and came to life. And everybody was running it on television. I mean, it wasn't until about, I think, two or three years ago that uh, NBC was able to grab the rights so that no one else could use it. Mm. And it's theirs. You know. And they're not letting those go. No, they're not. But that doesn't apply to the radio show. That's just for the film, right? It doesn't. Uh, Joe Landry got access to the script, and he did get permission from, I'm not sure if it was the estate of Capra, I'm not sure exactly Probably. where he got it to adapt it. There's actually two adaptations of Wonderful Life out there. I'm not sure who wrote the second, but we liked Landry's better, so well, we're attacking it that way. Um, I th yeah, I think uh, Capra owned all his films he had some kind of a deal with uh, Harry Cohen at Columbia, you know, where he, he, they were his. You know. We knew it couldn't have been George Lucas's idea in the first place. Somebody oh, yeah. had to be smarter than him first. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it must be a thrill to direct a play like that. It is. I mean, it, it's a responsibility yeah. as well. I, the thing that I really enjoy about the radio adaptation of it is it takes us to a point where we live in such a digital world where things are on our time. Yeah. We DVR shows, we take anything that we want, we have our music with us everywhere we go. And it's taken us away from the time where we would all gather together. To, I, I remember growing up, uh, I, I tell this story, The Sound of Music would be on and I would be allowed to stay up and watch The Sound of Music. It was only on once a year. Right. But I had to go to bed when they sang Good Night, Farewell. <laughs> and so until I was 13, I didn't know how it ended. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I figured it out. I did some research. <laughs> but. It was only on at that time. And if yeah. you wanted to see it, you had to gather as a family and do it. And radio shows were the same way, where everybody would gather in a room That's right. and listen to the show as it happened. And I think it's a great reminder, especially with a story like this, that the people that you gather with, the people that, whose lives you've touched, mm -hmm. get together at a certain time and listen to an event as it happens. And the theater's always been like that, too. It's the same way, yeah. So, and you remember it the next day you're talking about it. Exactly. Always, yeah. 
What else have you done, Nick? Uh, in Pittsburgh, I went to school at Oklahoma City University where mm -hmm. I studied music theater. And then I moved to New York City where I was a very successful bartender because I never <laughs> went to any auditions. <laughs> and uh, I realized that I was lacking a little something in my life. Are you going to mix the drinks after the show? <laughs> I, whatever you like. I know it. Uh, and I had a friend who started a theater in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he called me one day to be in a show in A Few Good Men. And uh, I went and worked for him. And by the end of the run of that show, I had bought into the company and stayed there. And, in Pittsburgh, I, I reawakened my love of the arts, and yeah. I directed for his company for a while. And while I was in Pittsburgh, I found that I could reach out to a lot of companies. It's a rich theatrical town. A lot yes. of people don't realize that. It is. I know it is. And uh, for the past yeah. seven years, I've worked with the Pittsburgh CLO in their education department. And when David and Aaron came out here, it, it was something that really appealed to me. Uh, as soon as they, he sat down at a at a very popular coffee shop and told me about the opportunity. And I said, go. And he said, well, the, the, the kids, the house. And I said, go. And I said, as soon as you can afford me, I'll follow you. And <laughs> they said, we can't bring you on full time, but, but can you come and, and be a part of this, this rebirth of this company that's been around mm -hmm. for five years and, and wasn't floundering by any stretch, but it's got new life breathed into yeah. it. And, and Derek and Jennifer who started it are still around. They're, they're still active. Uh, coming back to see the show. They still talk to us every time I get emails. And now all of a sudden this family affair just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And um, I'm in it, the year five ground floor. And it, it's very exciting. Is this your first endeavor with uh, Americana? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it okay. is. And you plan on staying, right, David? <laughs> uh, if I can find a way to keep him, I certainly you will would. Keep him, yeah. they, that's where the grant writing comes in. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be very happy to. Uh, I haven't spent this much time in Massachusetts before either, and mm -hmm. I find as I, as I get older, which I, I still have a little ways to go to catch up, <laughs> but you walk around cities, and, and some cities you enjoy, and, and, and some cities are just buildings. And I found that all the cities I've been to, all the little neighborhoods, the, the, the Quincy, the Carver, the Plymouth, oh, even yeah. the, the, the Boston, it, they all have a, a certain charm to them. The, the, new, the New England mystique isn't a... Isn't a Myth. That's it, right. It's it real. It, it really, really is. Yeah. There's something about the South Shore of Massachusetts that I I love. I'm a stranger north of Boston, <laughs> but South, oh, I love it. I just love it. You know, there's so much to do. I was a stranger south of Boston on the South Shore until a week ago, and now all of a sudden I feel like family. So. <laughs> and you're gonna love it in the summer. Yeah, it, it really, well, truly. They have to stop bringing me in for just the seasonal plays in the winter. I, I hear that you have beaches and things like that. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, we've got them all. That's going in my yeah. next contract, Ryder. Uh, I don't need a raise. I just, I just want nice weather. Okay, <laughs> you've got it. Well, we don't have much time left, but uh, I, I did want to talk to uh, David about one other thing. Yes. I understand that you have a small part in Love the Coopers. I do. Uh, it's a very small part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> In fact, it was one of those so small that I wasn't sure I was going to make it in. Well, you uh, did. Yes, uh, but I did. Um, and I've been told that I, I haven't seen it yet myself. Uh, it's funny, you run into theater, you don't have much time to do much else. Yeah. Um, I was a Christmas caroler in Love the Coopers. I spent about, uh, I spent 12 hours in a grocery store singing the same line of a Christmas carol, of a certain Christmas carol, over and over and over and over <laughs> again. Uh, the hardest part of doing it was that we were walking through the Christmas, uh, walking through the grocery store, and uh, we weren't allowed to s sing out loud. Mm -hmm. So uh, we actually had to have someone hiding below, following us with a click track, yeah. so we could all mouth the words at the right, same yeah. time. But <laughs> tiny little part. Uh, I, I I wouldn't say rush out to see me, but. Um, <laughs> But I did have a lot of fun doing that. Did you get to there. see any of the leads, Diane Ke I, Keaton or well that, June that, Squibb? Or yes, John actually. Um, Diane Keaton and uh, John Goodman, yeah. we, uh, the scene, we walk right up into their faces and start singing right wow. into their faces. So, yes, we were, we were mere feet away That's from great. them. Uh, June Squibb was there as well. Yeah. Uh, but She's fabulous. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love her. Oh, yes. I mean, I've seen her in a lot of movies lately. But uh, uh, Diane Keaton, John Goodman, they were so very nice, so yeah. very complimentary. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. All, as I, have, I have yet to see the, uh, the uh, film. Uh, I'm a member of the Broadcast Film Critics oh. Association, and we vote Critics' Choice Awards in uh, January. 
and uh, I'm looking forward to getting a screener, which is coming any day now, I hope. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to that nomination for yeah. best third featured. featured third caroler okay. from the How left. How much you going to pay me to vote? <laughs> <laughs> I work in theater. Where is, am it's I another grant. It? Okay. It's another grant, guys. Listen, you guys, congratulations on Americana Theater. Thank you so much. I think, I think you've got a great opportunity. You've got a great future ahead of you, and I wish you all the best of luck, and the same with your wife your lovely wife, and the rest of the cast. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, thanks for being on the show. Guy. Well, that's our show for this time. Um, you're watching Preview. My name is Guy Giampapa. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>